We wanted to recreate the feel of just like being at happy hour with your friends. Cheers to um, fun times in France. Um, I mean, I just Another like, round so. is a podcast hosted by myself and my colleague and creative partner, Heaven Nagatu. <laughs> <laughs> <Did you never remember? laughs> right. <laughs> so excited about our guest. Um, he is the human being behind the account Johnny Sun on Twitter, J-O-N-N-Y Sun, and is a little alien. He's just trying to figure out how Earth works, <laughs> and I can't wait to talk about it. When we sat down to figure out who the show was for, um, my instant thought was, it's for people like me, and that's black girls who don't see themselves anywhere else. So with the guests that we invite into the studio, we really try to think of who we're not hearing from enough and what we're not talking about enough, because we, as black women, know what it's like to not see ourselves reflected in uh, pop culture. And we know what it's like to not hear our own voices represented in national conversations. And we try to really do what we can to amend and change that while having fun. This book is Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien Too. Correct. It's beautiful. Welcome to the show. I feel like I always knew that I wanted to be a writer because, one, I thought that that was like the only thing I was good at, but also I was so shy and so introverted, and I had what I now know is generalized anxiety disorder. Back then, like, writing was the only way that I felt like I could be sufficiently heard and represented. So writing has always been super, super important to me and my identity and just like what I've been able to do in life. How's your book going? Can I ask that? I'm sorry, we are out of time. Oh, Thank wow. you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's there, you know, I'm working on the proposal. Mm. I'm trying to be patient and patient with myself and kind to myself. And yeah. that most often means that I just don't work on it. My undergrad experience was very, uh, it was white, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, but this was like a very, I'm trying to find a, an elegant way to say it was very racist because it was, you know, like there was a dorm named after Jefferson Davis who was the president of the Confederacy and there were Confederate flags everywhere when I first got there. I finished it because I'm stubborn. <laughs> uh, but as soon as I was done, I was like, I have to go to where the black people are. Like I need, I can't do another year of just like no diversity, of not being heard, of not feeling seen. I just couldn't do it anymore. And my two choices for Blackest City ever were Chicago and Philadelphia. I ended up in Philadelphia. It did not go well because my, you know, just like the stress and anxiety of like being in another city and being on my own for the first time for real. It was a lot, so I didn't get much writing done, but I did get a lot of growing done. I got laid off. And I'm like, great, this is the moment where I'm gonna become a writer and it's gonna be wonderful. So I was able to pick up some freelancing gigs with like Uptown Magazine. I did some stuff with TheRoot.com. And um, I was able to do that because I was, for one, for a long time, very underemployed. So I would just like tweet for hours and hours and hours. Twitter just gave me a really good space to develop like my voice as a writer and also my voice as a black woman writer. And it's during this era where I was, um, just tweeting all the time that BuzzFeed had just hired its, I think, third or fourth full-time black person, I think. And the internet was like, oh my gosh, BuzzFeed's getting so black, even though it's just like two more people had joined the ranks. Um, and that started a hashtag called Black BuzzFeed. And me not having anything else to do <laughs> in those few days, you know, I was tweeting along with it as well. But um, then I got a DM from somebody who was working at BuzzFeed and he was like, no, really, what if you came to work from BuzzFeed. And I was like, that's a nice idea, but I'm not gonna move because I never wanted to live in New York City. But almost four years later, I'm still here. So <laughs> they must have known something that I didn't know back then. I think like Black Twitter is like the lifeblood of yep. Twitter. And people Fast. need to talk Fast. about it. Hard agree. And like, <laughs> especially academia does not talk about Black Twitter mm. at all. Yeah. Do you think they actively avoid talking about Black Twitter? Because it's like beneath like scholarly whatever. I think it's just like they're afraid of talking about race in that way. Like there are a few um, Black academics who are like really into like that intersection between the internet and like and race. Um, mm -hmm. I, I never want to make it sound like I don't understand the privilege of working at a huge media company full of like young folks who are ambitious and daring and willing to put money behind things like this podcast. That's very rare. It's very, very, very rare. But once a company like BuzzFeed puts money into a show that's as black and unapologetic as ours is, hopefully like this will be a trend that like keeps up and then eventually media won't be so white and so male. But I mean, that really starts with insisting that people accept you for who you are, especially when the person that you are is someone that you don't see reflected in the movies and media that you consume. Because when you notice that 
your image is missing. There are tons of other people like you who also can't see themselves anywhere. So lean into, into making the content that you want to see. You know, like we, we can just sit in a room and just like be ourselves and we could talk about race and we could be like funny and serious and irreverent and heavy in the way that like having these conversations always plays out. I didn't know how Americans talked about race until I got here. And it was like, Ooh. it was a very strange experience. How do Canadians talk about race? We kind of don't. Like it's strange because this is the opposite of what I thought I would see myself doing like professionally as a living. But honestly, I think that the things that have happened that now have me in a position where I can even have this conversation is therapy and anti-anxiety medication. The first time I actually heard the word anxiety, like I almost cried because uh, it was, I, I, I didn't have a name for this thing that I was feeling, you know? One of the things that feeds and nourishes me so much about making this podcast is every once in a while we'll get um, a note from somebody who says, because of y'all, like I've, went and found a therapist or because of y'all I'm thinking about like taking an antidepressant or you know because of y'all like you normalizing these things and these issues and struggles that we have like it's making a real impact and difference in my actual life and that just like there's not a word that accurately describes like what that feels like and it's just been a joy to be able to do that. <laughs>